I think one of the funnest things I get to teach on, on a regular basis, that I get to look at and learn from myself, because the Holy Spirit gives me insight to things I never really would have pondered or imagined before, is the subject of grace. That very essence and nature with which love demonstrated is the action of God's forgiveness personified in the word that we use to describe a, a spiritual reality that he's able to do for us that we can't do for ourselves, which is the word we call grace. It's kind of an interesting concept because it's something that goes beyond comprehension. It goes so much more so to the direct interaction of the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of earth and says this will be overcome and that the way that God does it is true to his nature of love that he's able to change the incorruptible nature of himself to cause corruption to put on incorruption by the imputation of righteousness which is so amazing to me because you think about it and you think well how can something that is so perfect deal with something so imperfect as I am how could I possibly approach a holy God when we read in the Old Testament all these examples of what happens when imperfection deals with perfection? Or the imperfect comes in the presence of the perfect? Or the unholiness deals with the holiness of God? I would be very confused indeed if I had to live my life according to just the examples that I've read in the Old Testament. Now, I'll admit that having read the New Testament, I look back at the Old Testament and find examples of grace and mercy throughout the entire written Word of God so that I'm able to understand and see how God still is love in the Old Testament. But if I didn't have Jesus to explain it to me, if Jesus hadn't come and given me a living example of the reality of grace being personified, I never would have known that God wanted me to be saved. I would have thought that God wanted to, quite frankly, deal with sin and deal with life on a basis that might be closer to the Greek gods and the mythology of the Romans when they and the the, the Swedes or Norwegians when they came up with all this idea of the gods playing with man. Because in some ways I understand where people get those false ideas. I understand where people get this concept of a mad God. But the reality of when I have Jesus involved in that conversation, I no longer can think of God as mad. I have to deal with what Jesus said about God. I have to deal with what Jesus said and did about sin. I have to deal with the person of Jesus because he is the author and finisher of my faith. He's the one that I'm following and he's the one I'm listening to. So when I listen to Jesus and I involve myself in his life, in his will, in his way, when I ask him to lead me today by his spirit as the spirit of God reveals Jesus to me, then I see what grace really is. I see how grace really applies and I know what grace really means. And so this study of grace has gone on for a while where we've come up with some pretty interesting conclusions and dealt with some pretty interesting solutions about cheap grace and expensive grace and all of these other involved topics that really fall short of the glory of what God has revealed in His grace. Because you see, if you want to see the embodiment of grace, look at Jesus. If you really want to see the perfect example of love, look at Jesus. If you want to know exactly what God looks like, really, Look at Jesus. If you want to find the fulfillment of love, the embodiment of peace, the great overwhelming knowledge of joy, look at Jesus. Because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. But really, when you want to embody by action someone who has demonstrated what he said and what he did and what he meant, then look at Jesus. Because you see, to change Jesus' words in any way, shape, or form negates grace in your life and it creates this false Messiah, this false Christ, this spirit of delusion that comes upon the world that says you have to do something more than see Jesus. 
You have to accept something more than what Jesus did for you. You have to somehow add to or change what Jesus said to be because we don't want to see Jesus as He said He is. Because He lived it. He didn't talk the talk and not walk the walk. He loved His enemies. He was poor in spirit. He was all those things that He said on the Sermon on the Mount and more. He is the embodiment of grace. And that Sermon on the Mount that you look at, that is the way of grace. Grace changes everything because it makes you capable of being able to be like that because you will receive grace for grace. As you are forgiven, you will be forgiven. As you love, you will be loved. As you are giving joy, you will receive joy. Because it is about this flow to go, to be, to live, to experience and to know God in an interpersonal relationship. God in a way that comes down from heaven through the manifestation of your physical body in the flesh to the outreaching throughout the world and the universe of His Spirit ministering to those around you, all about you as light, as salt, as teaching, as witness, as demonstration of the work of God in your life. So it's not only about what you say and what you see and what you hear and what you do, but it's about what God is doing. And that's what grace is. You see, I found a perfect definition, and last week we read through this before, and we skipped over it pretty quickly, but we wanted to bring it to your attention one more time so that you would define grace by the means with which Chuck Smith did in his book, Why Grace Changes Things. This is a perfect good example of a quotation that you could probably put together for what grace really is. Grace is... Let's see, how do, let's read the whole thing in context, because it's kind of interesting. Contrast that with the work of Jesus. He doesn't try to lower the superego. He aims to bring up the ego. He wants to lift up the real you. In other words, your discussion from last week was about the ego and the id and the, you know, the identity crisis that we have, you know, where you're lowering the bar in order to make the distance between what you think you are and what you are lesser so that you'll accept yourself as you are, the way you are, and that isn't what God said. God said that He would change you into the image of what He said He wants you to be, which is the image of His Son. He wants you to become a son and daughter of God. He accepts you as you are because you can't do anything about it. What can God, a holy God do with an unholy person? Change them. He is the potter, we are the clay. He will change you. So, here's the interesting thing about the definition of grace. Even though the real me is well below the ideal me, nevertheless I am righteous before God and He looks at me as perfectly righteous because of my faith in Jesus Christ. This is the second aspect of the gospel of grace. First, all of your sins, this is the definition. First, all of your sins have been taken care of, washed, and forgiven because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Second, God looks at you as righteous because of your believing in Jesus Christ. Apart from what you are doing or not doing, apart from keeping any code of ethics, God is imputing righteousness to your account because you believe upon Jesus Christ. What can you say to that? Belief in the knowledge of what God has done for you is the reality of the imputation of righteousness to you that God is giving to you freely because of your faith in Jesus. And that relationship is established on the basis of coming to Him as He said you could and you should do. So if you have come to Jesus and accepted His mercy and forgiveness, then you have been given grace by God to go beyond that simple forgiveness of sin, to come into a relationship with Him, to have a personal intervention by God in your life daily, to be able to see Him, to seek Him, to follow Him all the days of your life, that you should know Jesus in a personal, intimate way. If you have a problem in the day, did you talk about God? Did you talk to Jesus about it this day? Because He'll give you grace. He'll forgive you of your sins if you commit them today. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the work of grace in your life. Because you believe. Jesus says, hey, I'm here. I'll do it. I got it. Here it is. Believe on me. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Shall you be? Yes. 
by the process with which God will begin to intervene in your life and begin to realize He did it. I couldn't. Because He did, I'm forgiven. What that does then is that when you have a proper understanding of God giving grace, when you have a proper understanding of God the Son making the means with which you could be given grace, then you have a proper comprehension of how you can receive grace without really doing anything about it at all except the simple fact of believing. Because it's by faith that we receive grace and it's by faith that we know that God exists. But whether you know that or not, God's going to reveal Himself very soon. It is the latter days and the end of time has come. The end of the church age is quickly coming upon us and you'll discover that God's going to peel the heavens back like a sardine can and you're going to see exactly what happens when the universe is revealed for what God is behind it. And it will terrify mankind and creation. So the reality of an unholy God is going to come into the conflict of a corrupted, unholy creation. And God is going to have grace upon it so that he will still proclaim his gospel still proclaim the work that Jesus has done, still make a way of salvation for those to receive it, but better that you receive it now and be accepting of what God has said He has done for you. Because if you're taking grace in any other way, shape, or form, and trying to make it into something you can use, or something you can abuse, or somehow lessening it, or making it greater or lesser, then you're really playing God with what God has done. You're taking a spiritual application of a term that we don't completely comprehend and trying to make it applicable to a practical situation that you're in. The reality is God says, I love you. Love covers a multitude of sins. How does God cover a multitude of sins? By love or by His grace? You see, grace is not only a verb, it is a noun. And the only way that it can be a verb and a noun, reading a reality without trying to, you know, morph the English language into something it's not is because it's a spiritual term that again is a demonstration of love by the action of God himself intervening in the reaction of sin and man trying to approach a holy God when we do that that interaction of an unholy man coming into the presence of God grace must be extended to that person lest they perish it's kind of like saying it this way as we've mentioned so many times before when a stick of wood comes into the presence of a raging inferno, poof, it's consumed. That's what you are. You see, in your present nature, should you not be changed to be in the very presence of God would consume you. John said so in the book of Revelation. When he approached heaven, he said, Oh, I'm as a man consumed, a man undone. And so the angel came and gave him a coal, I believe, from the, from the uh, altar. The same thing was true of another prophet, I think, if I recall right now off the top of my head. But the point is this. Your nature must be changed in order to be in the presence of God. And that nature, or that change of nature, is what we call being born again. You are born of the flesh, and your flesh is corruption. And in sin you were conceived, and in sin you would die. This incorruption must put on, cor this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortality, immortality. And you must change the way you are into the way He is in order for you to be in His presence. The way you do that is by grace. So it's by grace you are saved, and that not of yourselves, but it is a free gift of God with which He has chosen to make a place for you that you would be able to exist in His presence. Because He is a holy God, and His perfect righteousness and His perfect justice are all satisfied in the work that His Son has done. So let's read that again about a perfect definition of exactly what grace is, as Jesus has applied it to us, and as God has said it for us, because the work that God has done to us and for us is something that could only have been done by Jesus himself when he died on the cross and when he looked down and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the glorious gospel, the good news. To know that God accepts me by faith in Jesus Christ and that my righteousness is through faith in Jesus Christ is good news indeed. This then is the gospel for me, my faith in Jesus Christ. So, if you would but know the Lord, grow in the Lord, love the Lord, experience the Lord, listen to the Lord, walk in the Lord, walk with His Word, know His Word, 
discover what he has to say for you, read the letters in red or read the words in red and know how they bled, you know, and all you want to use for those analogies. Find out what grace really means, and you're going to find out it all points to Jesus. If you find out what grace is, you're going to find out that it's the fact of the reality of the imputation of righteousness by which God has done for you because you could not be forgiven of sin without Jesus dying on the cross to you because you committed the sin of deicide. Really. You killed Jesus. They often have this funny thing about books. You know, They like to come up with these cute phrases. A way to get your attention. A way to capture your imagination. To make you think on these things. Even though the Bible says, think on these things. And he tells you, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are holy, to be any virtue, to be any praise. Think on these things. But often books sometimes will bring home a point that maybe we hadn't thought of. And I read recently about, you know, who killed Jesus. And I got news for you. You did. It wasn't Pontius Pilate. It wasn't, you know, the Romans. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't anyone else. It was you. Your sin killed Jesus. My sin killed Jesus. But each one of those was done in a personal way because the personal application of that with which we are forgiven by grace is a personal demonstration of the reality of the sinfulness of our nature with which we approach a holy God. I am guilty of the sin of killing Jesus. So are you. Your sin killed Jesus. My sin killed Jesus. We owe Him our life. He was the one who in reality on the cross prevented our damnation, our condemnation, and our utter destruction. When he said the simple words to the world and all of creation from the place after he had said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He looked down upon the world that God so loved. And he said, Father, forgive me for the moment that you do. That is grace. That is love. 